Hello again, as you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and today's class is wireless access keys for Windows computers. So in the modern world, the thing that people are scared about most, of course, is security. You know, what about hackers, people getting in, grabbing information or damaging systems, all of that kind of stuff. The issue is, is that when you start dealing with actual users in the real world, they hate security with a passion. They don't want to deal with passwords. They don't want to deal with changing passwords. They write passwords down on post-it notes and stick it onto their monitors. It's a real pain in the butt. You know, people go to the bathroom and they leave their computers wide open and it's just like, oh, it's just a security nightmare. If somebody, if a hacker can penetrate into your building, they will almost definitely be able to get onto somebody's system that still has access to the network and then all hell will break loose. So what is nice in the modern world is we can start using these physical access tokens to allow people to gain access to their systems. And what's really nice is these tokens now can be wireless. So we showed you, uh, we did a class before uh, on the Atoma Sesame 2 wireless access key for Mac computers, and this is a gatekeeper access key for Windows PC. So what's nice about this is you can use this on Windows PCs in domain environments. So if you have a domain and you have secretaries or such, you know, that are that are causing problems with this whole password issue, you can give them these access keys for their computers and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. If they have the access key and they walk up to their computer, they will be able to access the computer and if they do not have the access key, they won't. And that will make your life a lot easier. So let's go over to the computer or the, uh, the demo table so I can kind of show you what is going on with this thing. So basically I have my little Surface 2 here. Uh, when you deal with something like the game Gatekeeper. Basically, this is the key itself. And then for Gatekeeper, they give you a little USB dongle. And this is actually a very nice thing. So when we dealt with the uh, the Atoma Sesame 2, they de dealt with a Bluetooth connection for their access key. So the access key is a Bluetooth device and it connects to your computer using Bluetooth. One of the issues with that is that for range, for distance from your computer in order to trigger uh, the lock mechanism, uh, it was actually a very long way. So for me, it was something like 25 or 30 feet uh, before the system would actually lock when I walked away with using the key. So the nice thing with using a dongle like this is I th they can be a little more specific about the distances. And so with this, um, it actually, like if, if you're only like, if you're down to like five or 10 feet away, it will lock all the way to a much longer distance. So that's one thing to think about whenever you're going to be getting these access keys is the question is how does it actually connect to the computer because if it connects to Bluetooth the range of this thing is going to be much longer than if you use something like one of these little USB dongles so this one can get pretty close so basically you've got this you've got the USB dongle past the USB dongle you then go and you install the app um, onto the computer and that is what sets everything up so let's go over to the actual computer screen so I, I can show you what is going on uh, on the computer and so basically you pull the app up and this is what you're looking at. So right here it shows you the signal strength. So as I move the key, you know, closer and further away, uh, it will show you that. It allows you to register the key. It allows you to lock the computer automatically when you walk away and unlock the computer automatically when you come close. And then you have this lock distance. So this lock distance, that's where I'm saying, you know, the closer or farther you are. So do you want uh, the computer to lock when somebody walks the, cu the next cube? Or do you want the computer to lock when they go all the way to the bathroom? You can, uh, you can adjust this to figure out where you want that to be. The only real pain in the ass, honestly, with these wireless keys is you can't put a distance. It would be really nice to literally put in here 10 feet or five feet or two and a half feet. Uh, the problem is they just kind of give you near and far. <laughs> so you're going to have to experiment and figure out how that works. And then what you can do is you can come up here to the update credentials. And here you plug in your username, you plug in the domain. So if that is a domain, you plug that in here and then you plug uh, the password and away you go. Um, I actually have to replug that information in in order to make that work. So hold on a second here. Let me let me give you my smiling face for a second. I don't want you guys trying to steal my 
my password because that would be a, a bad thing. Okay, so that's successfully updated. And so, okay, so then basically all we do, let's go back to our little demo table. And so how, how this works is, like I say, when you walk away from the computer, so I have my thing, I start walking away from the computer at a certain distance, uh, the computer will then simply automatically lock uh, so that you can't get access. So right now you can see it's automatically locked. I am, what am I? I am about 10 feet away from the computer right now. And so if I walk up to the computer now, I, I have no, I don't have the wireless key. And so when I try to log in, it's asking for the username and password. Oh, I can't hack into this computer. So let me go back and grab my wireless key off the floor. And so I walk up. I now have the wireless key and I have it on the near setting. As soon as I come close, now it's automatically logged in. And again, as I showed you before, you can put in those domain credentials. So this is a very, very valuable thing. Again, for all those employees that just don't want to deal with usernames and passwords, this is a way to make your security a lot easier. Uh, from what I've seen, both with this Gatekeeper and the Atoma Sesame 2, I mean, frankly, it's, it's solid equipment. I mean, it, it, this is something that, in fact, works. I have not had any issues dealing with these types of things. Um, the only issue at all really is the whole range issue, and that's just like, you know, hey, <laughs> it's, it's technology. What are you going to do? Now, if you're interested in anything like this. Um, again, there's lots of different options available. This, what I'm showing you guys today, is this gatekeeper. And you can go to gkchain.com to take a look at it. Again, seems to be a pretty solid little device. I really haven't had uh, any issues with it. If you go to actually buy one of these things, um, you can see they come in at $50 a piece, or you can buy a five pack for $225. So that'd be what, something like $45 a piece, which honestly, I mean, you know, you know, you know, I mean, everybody keeps complaining and bitching about things like price, like that's ah, too expensive. But I don't know, like if, if you could give this to your executive staff, like let, let's say you're like your C-level executives, if you could give them something like this, it seems like $45 would be worth it, to be honest with you. You know, if I had a staff of 100 people, um, I don't know how well it would work in, in an environment with 100 of these things running around, but I have to say, if I had a staff of 100 people and I could just give everybody one of these little tokens, it just seems like security overall would probably be better. Uh, the computers would get locked more often. It might be a better environment. So that is one thing that I would think about. I don't think the price point is actually too bad at $45, again, especially considering your environment. You just take this thing. You know, most people already have a lanyard or something with their little, they, most people have a security badge already, like an RFID security badge. So you just simply clip this with the RFID security badge that they already have. Um, I don't know, I think it would be a good thing. Again, you know, if you use it, especially since this uses uh, the actual Active Directory usernames, if you combine this with good group policy and other good security measures so that the person can only log into their particular computer, things like that, um, I don't know, I think this is. And if nothing else, if nothing else, what I'll say is if at $45, this is too expensive for you, when this comes down to $10 a piece, uh, then it will be an absolute steal. But yeah, so this is the idea, like I say, behind these wireless uh, keys. Uh, this, uh, you're seeing more and more of these things available. So, you know, what I argue with you guys, uh, you being IT professionals, is you need to look at where you are now and where you're going to be in the future. You know, what are you going to be deploying a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now? I would argue something like this should be on your deployment schedule. So whether you use something from Gatekeeper, whether you use something from Atoma, whether you use one of these uh, software apps, you know, in your smartphone that knock knock thing one of the things i would argue is you should have a point you should be trying to figure out how you're going to be implementing these things in the environment because i it is beautiful <laughs> it just brings a tear to my eye these things are just they just really are good and beautiful and nice and uh yeah yeah very little downside to it so uh so that's wireless access keys for Windows PCs. Uh, definitely take a look at it. If nothing else, play with it. Because again, whether, whether or not you want to buy these things now, 
I have to imagine within in the next couple of years, uh, something like this is going to be very standardized. So you, so you should be able to go to your CEO and be able to tell them what your plan is for these. Spiceworks.com. These guys have the free network management software, the free mobile device management software, the free community with millions of users. So if you need, if you're an IT professional and you need support, Spiceworks is a great place to go. All of their stuff is basically free and just an absolutely great thing. Again, if you have any questions that I don't answer in the show that are technical in nature, you know, we're talking about Active Directory synchronization between sites in remote areas. Uh, if you click on the link below this video, that will take you to the Spiceworks community. They have millions of users there that will be able to help you out. So take a look at Spiceworks.com. Veeam.com, V-E-E-A-M.com. If you just virtualized 100 servers and now you're trying to figure out how to back them up, they have solutions for ESXi, they have solutions for Hyper-V, and as you guys like, they have free stuff. So if you are dealing with a virtualized environment and you're trying to figure out a backup solution, take a look at Veeam.com. NerdsweCanFixThat.com. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, but you don't want to have to worry about coming up with a logo and copyright and trademark and all of those kinds of things, you may think about buying into a computer services franchise system. Nerds We Can Fix That is a computer services franchise system. They have 62 franchises throughout the United States. They can franchise in every state other than Hawaii. They also franchise internationally. If you're thinking about starting your own computer services company, you should contact them, fill out the information below, or give them a call. Again, as I will say, franchise systems are great for a lot of people, not so good for others always make sure to do your due diligence but if you're thinking about starting a computer services company anyway you might as well contact nerds we can fix that to see what they have to say Altero.com, A-L-T-A-R-O.com. If you're dealing with virtualization in a Hyper-V environment, so we're talking about Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012, and 2012 R2, take a look at Altero.com. They have a number of Hyper-V backup solutions. They have the free version, which will back up up to two VMs for free forever. They also have the unlimited version, starting at only $400 per host. I think this is a very good value. So if you are dealing with Hyper-V virtualization and you need a backup solution, take a look at altero.com. AdAxis.com. If you're dealing with Active Directory on a large scale, so you have hundreds of users to add, hundreds of users to disable, so on and so forth, you may want to take a look at AdAxis.com. This is Active Directory management and automation software. So this tries to automate and simplify the Active Directory workflow. So if you are in a large scale Active Directory infrastructure, take a look at AdAxis.com. Plixer.com. Plixer deals with NetFlow analytics software. So NetFlow is a component of Cisco equipment that shows you what's going on at the network layer, what devices are talking to what other devices, what kind of network jitter, all of that kind of stuff. So Plixer has a free piece of software called Scrutinizer. Scrutinizer is a free NetFlow network traffic analysis tool. So if you want to play around with NetFlow, if you want to see what's going on with the network layer and you have Cisco equipment, take a look at Plixer.com. Click on the link below this video. It'll bring you to this page where you can download Scrutinizer, the free NetFlow network traffic analyst analysis tool. SchoolyMitchell.com. If you're trying to find better internet or telephone service, or if you're trying to find less expensive internet or telephone service, give Schooly Mitchell a call. Basically what these guys are, these guys are telecom consultants. You call them, you say what you need for yourself or your client, and they figure out the best option. They'll examine your existing services and review your bills to make sure there are no errors. Then they'll keep an eye on your services moving forward so that everything remains optimized. Because Schooly Mitchell is objective and independent, they have no ties to vendors. You know they are always your best interests in mind. The best part is there is no fee for their services. The only cost is a portion of the shared savings over a set period of time. If they don't find savings, there is no cost to you. Schooly Mitchell. Is managing users and computers on Active Directory too cumbersome? Download SolarWinds Terrific Trio of free Active Directory admin tools today and start saving time on those Active Directory management tasks. These free tools help you manage and remove computers and users from Active Directory and allow you to add users in bulk. The free tools uh, include inactive user account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove users who have not logged in for a certain amount of time. Inactive computer account removal tool enables you to scan Active Directory and optionally remove computers that are over a certain number of days old. And user import tool saves time by giving you the ability to create users in bulk using a CSV file. You can even specify the attributes. Also be sure to check out SolarWinds community page 
thwack.com to connect with more than 100,000 IT professionals. So take a look at solarwinds.com for their free and other tools. So today's hands-on review is the Hot Swap Caddy from Icy Dock. And this is one of those really like geek sexy things that Icy Dock comes up with. If you're an IT geek, this is just cool. Even if you don't really have a reason to use this thing, this is just one of those things you want to buy because it just makes you feel so cool. Essentially what this is, is this is an internal uh, hard drive docking station for your server or desktop computer. So this is a five and a quarter inch uh, form factor uh, slot. So it goes in uh, where an optical drive or such would go into your desktop computer. And once it is then in, you can plug in hard drives and eject them essentially like you would an old floppy disk. So remember when you had those old floppy disks? Do any of you remember floppy disks? Anyways, for you guys that actually remember floppy disks, remember floppy disks and you used to shove them in, you know, do whatever you're going to do, and then you push the button and they pop out? This essentially turns hard drives into floppy disks. So you have a four terabyte drive, that is now a massive floppy disk. You have a, a solid state drive, you can plug it in, massive, very fast floppy disk. So let's go over to the, uh, the, desk, the, the demo area so I can show you this thing. Because again, this is just one of those, this is those geek sexy things. Like again, seriously, even if you don't need one, it is just really cool. Uh, you would use this for things like data recovery uh, or backup solutions, and it's just a really great idea. So with this, you can put in either a, a two and a half inch drive or a three and a half inch drive or both of them at the same time. So I take my little two and a half inch drive and basically I slot it in. You see it has a normal SATA connector in there. And if this was plugged into a normal computer, I could now use uh, this little solid state drive. If I wanna bring it out, all I do is I hit the eject button and it comes out. I can then take my, my normal three and a half inch drive. I can take it, again, I can slot it in just like I would a floppy drive. It's in there, I use it, I do data recovery, I do backup procedures, I do whatever when I'm done. I hit the reject button and pop it out. I mean, seriously, guys. <laughs> I mean, like, is this not is this not the absolute coolest thing? Uh, seriously, I mean, I know other people want to have like gaming systems with like three, 4K monitors, but I just don't find that as cool as this little thing. I just really think this is great. And especially, like I say, as an IT technician, this is, this is awesome. Because you can do things like, if you're going to do data recovery, this is so much better than using an enclosure or a docking station because you connect to the internal controller of the computer. You don't have to worry about your USB connection failing. You don't have to worry about all the, you know, the quirkiness with USB or Thunderbolt or any of that kind of stuff. You're plugging your drive into your computer as if it is a normal part of your system. You can then run, you know, like I say, the full data recovery and away you go. Again, for things like backup routines, for the absolute fastest way for doing backup routines, this is the way to go. I mean, you have a four terabyte drive, let's say, you plug that into your computer, you run the backup routine, you eject it, and away you go. If that, if you don't find this just absolutely geek sexy, you're just not a geek. I, I do have to say, you just are not a geek if you don't like this thing. Uh, if we go over to the computer just to show you what's going on with this little guy, um, again, we go to icdoc.com, so icydoc.com. This is the Duo Swap MB971SP hyphen B thingy, and you go in and it gives you a lot of information. I mean, there's not, there's not really a whole hell of a lot to say. It, it is what it is. If we go over and we look to where to buy, or no, we go over to buy it now, and we go over to newegg.com, we can see that the price is $39. So it comes out to $40, which again, for this type of equipment from Icy Dock, um, I would argue, I think that is a good price. Um, especially, like, if you look at the uh, at the normal, like the USB uh, docking stations, a lot of those, I mean, those run all the way up to $40. And this, again, like I say, this gives you an internal connection to your desktop computer for data recovery or backup or any of that kind of stuff. Um, 40 bucks isn't I mean, it really isn't a bad price. Again, IC Doc, all of their stuff is just built well. You know, this isn't Rosewell crap. This isn't TrendNet or any of that. I mean, this is all just very, very, very good IT equipment. Again, you know, this is what you want to see when you buy IT equipment is, is that you can just use it. You know, you slot things in, you're able to pull them out. You notice that, you know, there's no... 
you know, the drives don't catch on anything. You can pull the drives in and out. You don't have to wiggle them in there and make sure it works. You know, if you're having a bad day, if you're, if you're having a 24 hour shift and you just need to get your job done, you can just, you can just do it. You don't have to worry about this equipment. That's one, that's one of the reasons I like IC Dock. I, I've reviewed a lot of IC Dock equipment. And I do have to say it is for this kind of like IT stuff, it is just rock solid, I really do have to say. So take a look at this. Again, this is the Hot Swap Caddy from Icy Dock. Again, just a really, really cool, nifty idea. And again, at a $40 price point, I don't see the downside, especially if you're doing data recovery or you're using hard drives as your backup routine. I mean, it's just a no-brainer, I would argue. So this question comes from Chris M. I just watched your video uh, on introduction to hacking. I have a question. Do you know how to remove a mug shot off of the internet? So this is a very interesting question, and it's one of those questions a lot of people ask. And sadly, in reality, there's just about no way to actually get it off the internet. The important thing that you have to realize here is that whenever you have uh, any interactions with the government, by and large, it is something called public record. Uh, so when you pay your taxes, it's public record. When you get arrested, it's public record. Um, and the reason that the, the records uh, are public is to, to make sure that there's checks and balances and the citizenry supposedly knows what the government is doing and so on and so forth. So the issue becomes uh, with public records is, is all these records have been public basically since the founding of the nation. You know, the, the idea that if you get arrested, uh, the information should be written down and the public should know about it. I mean, that, that, that's been there. Um, I learned how to do private investigation two, you know, 20 years ago, long before Facebook and the internet is, as you guys know it. And even back then, I mean, basically you could walk into a courthouse and demand things like people's uh, birth certificates. And I actually did that. I, I went to a, to a courthouse in a couple of states away because I was doing some research and literally was able to walk in, paid 20 bucks or whatever for the record, and literally got somebody else's birth certificate, not mine. I just said, I need a copy of this person's birth certificate. And they said, give me, give us 20 bucks. And basically they handed it over. So these records have been public for a long time. The thing is, before though, uh, you know, we talk about one of the ways you, you have security is something called security through obscurity. Basically, uh, you make it so difficult uh, to, to get information or get to a vulnerability that people simply don't do it. So, you know, all this information has been sitting in courthouses for literally hundreds of years. Anybody could walk in and for five or 10 or 20 bucks get their hands on it. But you actually, in fact, had to walk into that courthouse in order to get it. So if somebody wanted your mug shot, and you were arrested somewhere in, you know, in some county in California, they would literally have to go to that county in California, go to the courthouse or wherever else, again, throw the money down and be able to get it. So that keeps people um, a little honest in all this stuff. Well, we get to the internet age, right? And all these records are in fact public. They're supposed to be available to the public. Uh, and so um, a lot of the government institutions are um, making them available on the internet. So that mugshot that, that would have been collecting dust in some sheriff's office or something like that is now posted to the internet uh, in one of these governmental databases. Well, then what happens after that? So that's public knowledge, public record. You can't really do anything about that. I mean, you, you might be able to do some, you know, if you have $50,000 you want to waste on a lawyer, maybe you could figure out a way to, to get your, your mugshot stripped. Uh, but generally not. It is there for public record. Well, the thing is now, uh, companies have figured out a great business model is to go out and scrape uh, all these public records and then create mugshot websites, right? So, you know, uh, basically, you know, people are interested on, in people who, who get arrested for different crimes. And so what they do is these companies go out, they, they create the, these scraping algorithms that scrape uh, the mugshots and the information off of all these public records websites and then compile that into one on website so people can go there and gawk and go look at the criminals right which uh you know is really cute and fun for them but can be an absolute pain in the ass for you um and unfortunately not a whole hell of a lot you can do about it uh you know if it's one of these like sex uh um sex uh pictures you know so like a lot of girls their boyfriends take pictures of them and post them to like these blackmail websites uh sometimes you can do something about that uh because the blackmail websites actually make money by charging you to take your picture down so it's horrible and it's heinous and it's absolutely disgusting but if you hand them two hundred dollars uh, many times they'll they'll just take your your picture down uh and, and then you'll be done with it unfortunately 
unfortunately, with this type of thing, uh, again, they are scraping public records. So even if this website did theoretically take your mugshot down, another website could just scrape the exact same information and put it back up. Again, it's all complete public record. It's so there's not a whole hell of a lot you can do about it. So, you know, as I say at the end of the day, don't get arrested. <laughs> You're like, damn you, Eli. Um, no, uh, basically at the end of the day, uh, this is where I would argue that we as a society have to be more comfortable about being honest about who we are. We have a lot of criminals in the society, but uh, at any one point in time, there's like 2 million people going through the criminal justice system. That's a lot of people. I mean, there, there's it's something, what, something like 5% of our population, some ridiculous number of our population has been through the criminal justice system. And so what I would argue is that we just have to start getting more honest about this stuff. Yes, I was convicted of a crime. This is why this is why I did the crime. This is what happened. This is why it won't happen again. I am the best person that you can hire. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I would argue, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, when you guys ask me questions and when I deal with questions from clients and all that, uh, there are technical solutions to problems. And then there are like sociological, psychological uh, solutions to problems. And what I would argue here is this is that psychological, sociological problem. If you have a mugshot and you're worried about it jeopardizing you being able to get a house, you being able to get a job, all of that kind of stuff, what you need to do is you need to work on being an upstanding citizen. If you make the reputation, your reputation within your community, that you are an upstanding, by you know, straight arrow, by the book type of person, even if you have this criminal record in your past, people will overlook it. Uh, if you have this criminal record in the past and you kind of like the gangsta life, then people are going to look at you and go, well, he's kind of gangsta and he's got a criminal record and I just want nothing to do with it, right? That is the truth. A lot of people, you know, they, they argue about, oh, oh, nobody will let me live down my past. And then when you look at them, it's like, well, because you're not really doing anything different than when you were in your past. So maybe it's time to move on a little bit, right? That would be my thought. But yeah, as far as getting your mugshot off the internet, mm -hmm, uh, yeah, you're screwed. So this question comes from Mohammed M. I'm currently in my junior year of my bachelor's degree, specializing in security and networking. I would like to stand out when applying for a job with no experience. Therefore, what security certifications would you suggest I should have? Uh, security Plus, CEH, uh, ECSA, CISSP, or something else? So this is one of those questions I get from you guys a lot, and well, I just kind of rub my little temples. I'm like, ah, but anyways, um, basically, um, <laughs> apply for a job with no experience get experience that there's the answer just get experience nobody cares about you if you don't have experience if you got experience then then, you, then then you're in the game then you're a player if you have no experience you're just worthless basically kind of sort of yeah no really yeah without experience you're just not much good at anything so what i would argue is if you're in your college program right now and you're you're, you're in your junior year get experience at least here i don't know where you're going to school at least here in the united states uh most of these college campuses have things like help desks um that you can get a job you know the campus help desk or the campus IT department. They're crappy, horrible, nasty little IT jobs, but there's something that you can put on your resume, and you are, in fact, doing something. I mean, you're doing the lowest level of possible of IT work for a public institution, but it is a level of IT work. Uh, so get experience, get experience, get experience, get experience, get experience, get experience. Pass your experience, asking, you know, do you get your Security Plus, your CEH, your ECSA? What I'm looking at here is you're saying you're getting a bachelor's degree specializing in security and networking. Right. So I, I'm not sure at this point in time, I, I would worry about the Security Plus and the CEH and the ECSA and all that kind of stuff, because aren't you, in fact, getting a bachelor's degree in security and networking? So that bachelor's degree is supposed to be worth something. And I would hope to hell it's worth a little bit more than a Security Plus certification. Kind of get my drift there. Um, you know, as I argue with you guys that want to go into security or hacking, remember, security or hacking is a is a is a, a specialization of the over the overall IT field, right? I mean, you go in and you you compromise um, these systems, and the way you compromise these systems is knowing where the weaknesses are. So, in order to know where the weaknesses are, 
it's good to know the systems, right? So many of you guys want to compromise Linux systems or Microsoft systems or any of these systems without actually knowing the system, which doesn't really make a whole lot of, a lot of sense to, uh, to me. So what I would argue, if you're already getting a bachelor's degree in security and networking, I would argue you actually don't worry about the cert security certifications right now, uh, but rather you go for the normal certifications. So the MCSE or the MCSA, the Microsoft stuff I would go for, uh, for you, for you and you only, uh, probably the CCNA I would go for. So you have that network, that that practical networking certification. Um, also go for the CCNP down the road, but go for the CCNA. So I would go honestly for the more normal certifications because that will also help you getting a job when you first come out of college. Um, Again, depending on where you are in the world and what the demand is like and what resources you have available, whether you or not you have a security clearance, whether or not you're prior service military, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the reality is, who the hell wants a noob security person? Seriously. I mean, we're not even talking like a noob IT person. Who the hell wants a noob security person? Not me. Um, so one of the things you have to realize is to actually get a job truly in security, you may, you're probably going to have to put a couple years in in a normal IT department. Because again, security, security is about securing your overall infrastructure. If you don't know what infrastructure looks like, if you don't know how infrastructure works, if you don't know how to deploy and maintain and install, then how are you going to secure? You may get a job, but... So, um, so I would argue your, your initial track should be much more on the normal IT stuff uh, and then go from there. When you have four years experience, then start worrying about the Security Plus and the CEH or the CISSP and all that kind of stuff. Uh, go at it that way. And again, once you have that experience, the people will tell you what they need. You go to a recruiter. You say, I really want to specialize in IT and they, or in security. And they say, okay, you've, you've already got these credentials. The credential you really need is... ECSA or something like that. So that would be my argument. Go for the normal or normal certifications. Because again, you're, you're supposedly you're already getting a bachelor's degree in security. So I would hope to hell that is worth more than security plus. Although in the modern education system, yeah, that might be a little optimistic. But uh, but yeah, that's that, that's what I would say. So for my final thoughts today, I just want to say I'm very excited because I made like $11 off my vlog channel yesterday, which is just, I think, oh, so cool. So as you guys know, I have my Eli the Computer Guy main channel, and then I've been playing around with the Eli Computer Guy live vlogging channel, and I've been playing around with it for a little while, trying to figure out what to do with that channel, and I started putting a little bit of effort into it, and now I'm very excited because it's actually starting to make me a couple of bucks. So it's only made me about $62 total for the month, but as you can see, it was puttering along here at 18 and 19 and 56 cents, uh, and then it jumped up to like four and five dollars and then yesterday it went all the way up to eleven dollars and eighteen cents now a lot of you guys are probably looking at that and going okay Eli, that, that's nice um maybe eli isn't as successful as we thought if he cares about eleven dollars and sixteen cents or eighteen cents but what i want to show you what i'm trying to show you with all these little videos is again the basic concepts of business so if you look at this right now right if you look at this as a normal person would look at this you look at this as $11.18 in one day and $62 overall for a month, and you go, whoopee, horse crap, right? $62 for a month, $11 in a day. You look at that like a normal person, and you go, wow, isn't that cute? I guess that might pay for a date to take a girl out, but it's not anything impressive. But if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a startup founder, this is amazing. This is super sexy cool because what it's showing, and the important thing that you want to see in any business is growth. It's not the fact that it starts at 19 cents per day and goes up to 11.18 per day. It is that there has been that amount of growth in that short of a time so that it is going somewhere. So this is what you want to see in your business. The overall, the total number does not matter so much as an entrepreneur. Whether you're making $10 a day or $100 a day or $1,000 a day or $10,000 a day, that 
that is that number is not really what is significant for you. What you want to be seeing is you want to be seeing growth. Is what you're doing bringing in more money than it did yesterday? Did you bring in a dollar yesterday and you brought in a dollar fifty today? Yes, a dollar fifty may, may not be a lot of money, but that's fifty percent growth in a single day, which is insane. Which if you go along that pattern, you know, in I don't know a year, you might actually be making some real money. And so this is the type of thing that I want you to be thinking about with your business. Don't focus on the total number so much. Again, whether it's $62 or $6,200, that is not the significant thing for the entrepreneur. Is do you have growth? Have you gone from 18 cents per day to $11 per day? Because that is the type of thing that you can start planning for in the future. I mean, in all in all honesty, you know, when I started focusing on this YouTube channel, it wasn't a joke. I mean, I had made like five or $600 uh, the month that I decided I am all in, stop doing the consulting, entirely focused uh, on uh, the YouTube because I saw that growth. It had gone from nothing to 100 to 200 to 300 to 500 to 600. And so, although I wasn't making $10,000 a month yet, I could see where the path was going. And so that is one of the things that you wanna look at as a business. Do you actually have a growth path? And the other thing too is, like I say, the, the significant thing is do you have a growth path? And so the other thing is, I mean, if you are just flat, if you're at like 18 cents now and you've been at 18 cents per day for six months or $100 per day and you've been at $100 per day for six months, that is the other thing to think about. Like if you don't have any growth, is this thing that you think will continue and is actually worthwhile? So yeah, I am, I am, I am super excited. Yes, I know $11 doesn't really buy me a whole lot, but the fact that I have that much growth and that short a time is really cool. Because if this thing could start bringing in uh, decent money on top of my other channel, um, I will be a very, very, very happy boy. So, uh, so wish me luck, cross your fingers, wish me luck, and we will see what happens with the vlog channel going into the future.